and Oklahoma was a musical, wide, wide, wide angle shot musical. Uh, I didn't mention King, King Solomon's Mind, not only did he win the Academy Award for it, but it was only the second film ever shot on location in Africa. So, yeah, it's a very interesting film, very interesting shot, very, the Technicolor in it was praised at the time as the best use of Technicolor in the film to that time. Uh, so it's just one thing after another he keeps doing that's, that's putting him at the top of it. Quo Vadis, I was around that when I was a little kid. My dad was on that with Bob. My dad was on Macombo where they went back to Africa. He was on King Solomon's Mind and Macombo. Long, long trailer was a comedy with Lucille Ball from I Love Lucy about this couple taking their vacation across America and this super long trailer behind their car. And so what you see here is one of the other things about Bob was he could shoot any genre of film. And what happens to directors of photography in particular is they tend to get placed in one or two genres that they shoot westerns well, they'll shoot westerns, if they shoot action films well, they'll shoot action films. If they shoot uh, like romantic comedies and things like what's his name who shoots with Woody Allen, they'll shoot those type of films. Not many of them crossed over from. Some of them could do two, three genres. Bob did it across the board. He could come to him any kind of film, and he would deliver as fine a looking film as anybody could deliver within that genre. That put him up on that list. Uh, ben Hur. Ben-Hur has one of the most famous sequences of any movie in the history of the movies, and it's the chariot race scene. And it was a scene, they were in, my dad was the executive in charge of production for that, I'm going out, and, uh, uh, and Bob was the director of photography. It took them 40, 42 days actually, to set up that scene, to plan it, and figure out all the technical stuff about it. And if you ever get a chance to see that, that uh, sequence, it's one of the most famous sequences in movie history. And they have it on the Academy Awards almost every year. That sequence is on the Academy Awards. It's a, a storied, storied sequence. And at the time, it was the hardest technical shoot of, of anything that had ever been shown. And it's absolutely gorgeous, absolutely beautiful. Um, Bob parted ways with uh, MGM over, uh, he had done Raintree County with Elizabeth Taylor and Monty Cliff. And uh, Liz had been raised on a lot. She was a bit of a diva and uh, uh, had a little alcohol and pill problem. And uh, Monty Cliff had the same thing. And so they show up at the set all the time, looking like hell. And if the actors don't look good, the job of the cinematographer is to be responsible for everything that's inside that image. It falls on the cinematographer to make it look good. So you do a lot of extra work. You have to change lighting usually. You do a lot of extra work. And so after Rainford County, Bob, they wanted Bob to shoot Liz Taylor's next film, which was going to be a film called Suddenly Last Summer. And Bob said, no, I'm not going to do it. And they said, well, you're under contract to MGM. You're going to do what we tell you to do. Bob said, I'm not going to do it. I don't care what you guys do. Sue me. Fire me. I'm not doing it. So they said, OK, you can take, you have one year left on your contract. You can sit out that year. We won't allow you to work for anybody else, and we won't pay you. And he said, fine. And he went back up to Carmel, where my whole family lives, and uh, to his gardens. He has like two acres of gardens around his beautiful home he has up there. And uh, sat out the year, rather than work with Elizabeth Taylor. Year, a few years later, when Fox got ready to do Cleopatra, and they had Elizabeth Taylor for the lead, and Zanuck and uh, the producer and director came to my dad and said, listen, Liz wants Bob to shoot this thing. My dad said, then he won't do it. 
And they said, well, will you go talk to him? And he said, yeah, I'll talk to him, but I'll tell you right now, we won't do it. And uh, they said, well, listen to this. We're going to offer him more money than we're offering the director. We're going to offer him the largest salary of any cinematographer in the history of the movie business. And I said, I'll go tell him, but he won't do it. And my dad went and talked to Bob, came back. He won't do it, guys. <laughs> he didn't care if you want to give him the studio. He won't do it. And uh, so it tells you a little bit about what he was like. Not only was he a perfectionist in terms of his work, you know, but he didn't take much crap from anybody. Be it a director, be it a producer, be it a film star. You know, and he talked right back to him. Yeah. Um, but his work, he was always, always, he won the Academy Award for Ben Hur. Mutiny on the Bounty, the big Marlon Brando picture, shot Tahiti. Uh, it took him a year to shoot it because Brando, would, you know, was kind of a little, a little bit like Liz. <laughs> he was, uh, I don't know, what's the male version of the uh, Brando was, the, was that. <laughs> and uh, and it, took, it, it, it took over a year to do it. And during this time, my cousin Bruce, Bob's uh, uh, son, had gone to Brooks Institute in Santa Barbara and had started working on Bob's crew, working his way up from being a second assistant cameraman to being a camera operator. And uh, uh, by the, the first picture he worked on for Bob was Mimi on the Bounty. It was right out of Brooks Institute and uh, he worked as a second assistant on that. My dad was in charge, executive in charge of production for that because it was a big overseas, huge, spectacular production. And so we were over there, and I spent uh, about half a summer over there while they were shooting it. And uh, when we used to go out on the heat, go, go out on the bounty, and we'd go to the island that Brando ended up buying. Of course, Tarita, the girl that Brando ended up marrying and having his, his two of his children with, he met there, and she was there all the time. This beautiful French Polynesian girl. And uh, uh, quite a movie, quite a, a, an outdoor movie shot on a boat. One of the worst, two worst places you can shoot. In the snow and on the water. Reflection. Big problem is reflection. You can't control the light. The light hits the snow, the light hits the water, it bounces everywhere. And you can't have that shooting. you got to be controlling the light that you're shooting. Uh, if you ever see this movie, it's a beautiful, beautiful movie. PT-109 was the story of President Kennedy's, uh, from his, President Kennedy's book uh, about his uh, command in World War II of this PT boat and this incident that happened. Uh, of course, being, uh, being Catholics, we were all for Kennedy, you know that. And, uh, and uh, everybody, boy, everybody went to the premiere of that movie. Everybody wanted to, to go to that movie and, and meet Kennedy. The Collector. The Collector is one of my favorite films, Bob's, and it's a, it's a hot. It's a, a I guess it's a horror picture. Would you say? Ed? I mean, it's you know, just barely, and it's about Rod Steiger plays this guy who collects butterflies, and he uh, abducts. Samantha Ager, the British actor Samantha Ager, to put her in his collection. And uh, so it's a very dark, very dark and moody, but has these beautiful colors, some like these butterflies and these other things in it. It's a very well shot movie. It's a great movie. Anybody who's interested in being a cameraman to take a look at. Dr. Doolittle, I was working at Fox in the summertime and got assigned to Dr. Doolittle, which, which my uncle was shooting. It was with Rex Harrison and a bunch of animals. Animals everywhere. You know, you know what they say in the movie business? You don't want to shoot with kids or animals. And boy, is that true. <laughs> we had animals everywhere. We're forever chasing animals. Now. Then comes The Graduate. Now, this is 1967. My cousin is, is doing his work, and, and, and uh, I think he was. It was right around the time he became a DP. Um, 
I was still at Stanford, but I was getting ready to go to USC Cinema for my master's degree. I was just finishing up uh, my English creative writing degree at Stanford. And my cousin and I were watching all the kind of art films at the time. And all the art films were coming from Europe at that time. And they were part of what was called the New Wave, or the Nouvelle Vague, is what the, the French called it. And it was a bunch of French film critics who started this movie, uh, started this magazine called the Cahier du Cinema, and started writing about the directors that directed different movies, and started identifying traits that would run from one movie to the next by a particular director. And they developed this uh, theory called the auteur theory. Auteur stands for author. The, the director was the author of the film. Now, he's not the author of the film. The writer's the author of the film. Yeah, I've been a writer. I'll stand for that one forever. <laughs> and, uh, but this is the theory that came about. And it came about because all these critics that did this wanted to be directors. And lo and behold, most of them became directors. And they were people like Jean-Luc Godard, Francois Truffaut, Michelangelo Antonioni. I mean, they, were, they didn't just become directors. They became the hottest young directors of their day. And you waited for films to come out by these guys. There was a whole bunch of them, second layer of them, too. And they were using the newest, lightest, smallest equipment. And they were shooting their films in styles that were very, used a lot of rapid cutting, used a lot of zoom work, used a lot of handheld camera. The handhold of camera in those days was a lot different than doing it today. Today they have all these devices, they have gyroscopes on them, they have, in those days you just threw it on a thing, put it over your shoulder, and walked or ran or you know, were on a dolly with it. it. Didn't make any difference what you were doing, but it wasn't easy to do. And so these, these movies had kind of a frenetic look about them. You know? And of course, all the young guys, like Bruce and myself, we loved this stuff because it was different. It was getting away from the, Hollywood, the standard Hollywood thing. Um, and a lot of directors who, who came out in the late 60s and early 70s, American directors, were heavily influenced by this. Arthur Penn, Francis Ford Coppola, uh, uh, Mike Nichols, who directed The Graduate. It was his second directorial job. Mike had been a stand-up comedian for the woman named Elaine May, and then he had been a Broadway theatrical director, and then he came into movies. And so they put Bob on the, on the film with Mike Nichols. And I mean, Bruce and I had a good six to eight fights a year with Bob over this new way to shoot movies. And he just hated it. He came up under the old system where you used a real hot light on the main actor and you used this huge equipment and everything was kind of languid and everything moved very smoothly and it was a little slow for the young guys, you know, and we were all into this new stuff. And so he'd tell us off, I don't know how many times he told us how stupid this stuff was. But we go to see this movie and we go to the very first screening. He made sure we got to the very first screening on the lot. So it was all people who were involved with the movie. And we come out of the movie, and Bruce and I look at each other and go, Jesus, he just used every new wave technique there is. <laughs> what the hell is he talking about? Bob comes walking out, and he takes a look at us, and he gets this kind of sly smile on his face. And he walks up, and he says, I know. And we go, well, what, what's the deal? I thought you hated this stuff. He said, you know, I figured since everybody was doing it, I was going to show them how to do it. The Graduate became the first American movie shot with those techniques, and those techniques dominated American filmmaking for the next 20 years. So it was a pretty, pretty dramatic choice on Bob's part. Two Mules for Sister Sarah was a Clint Eastwood picture, but Clint didn't direct it. He didn't direct it. Uh, he just acted in it. A guy named Don Siegel directed it. Don had been a kind of a cult director, made Invasion of the Body Snatchers. He was famous for that. He'd been a very successful film noir director in the 50s. And he was Clint Eastwood's mentor. 